Hebrews chapter number 2, and I think this is five times, one, two, three, four, five times that we've preached there on, on our relationship with the Word of God as God's people and how that, that will determine uh, whether we grow or not. God magnified His Word, children. Yeah, amen. Magnified it above His name. Amen. And uh, He wants us to respect His Word. Amen. Hebrews chapter 2, this is where we started five sermons ago. And I'll go back there just for a minute. Then we'll, maybe you could look in chapter 12 also. And we'll talk about uh, uh, if we disobey God's Word. We said you could drift from God's Word. We said you could doubt God's Word. You could be dull towards God's Word. You could despise God's Word. And now just we would finish this up just with a simple, if we disobey God's Word. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape? Yeah. That's enough. Yeah. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and let me read verse 11. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grieving. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Now we've talked of the problems with the free will of man that God in His sovereignty allowed. Yeah. Now that's, that's a hard one. I, what I, I just said you need to grasp. Yeah. God in His sovereignty has allowed for the free will of man. Amen. Paul's desire was that we would go on to perfection. Yeah. And the way that is done is through discipline. Yeah. Chastening. Amen. That God chastens us when we drift and when we doubt, when we get dull and when we despise, God chastens us. All five of those are listed in uh, Dr. Tabb's book on Hebrews, if you, if you, I don't know where you got that when he was here for revival, not if you didn't, it would be a good thing for you to have. It will help you because he, uh, he teaches basically the same thing that I'm teaching you about how God deals with his children. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today for the privilege to pray. Lord, we always want to thank you for uh, being allowed to come boldly to the throne of grace that we might receive help in time of trouble. Lord, that we might look to you as the author and the finisher of our faith, that our Father, you might help us as we go down this life pathway. Give us grace as we preach today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So today I want to look at this subject, uh, verse 5, disobeying God's Word. And now if you don't disobey, never have disobeyed God's word, probably just go ahead and turn your hearing aid off because I'm not talking to you. But I'm talking to people, and if you're like me, there's times when you disobedient yeah. child. Amen. I never knew a child that didn't need chastening. Yeah, amen. Right. And the Bible says that whenever we are chastened of the Lord, He's got a purpose in the chastening that comes. And there's three responses that we can have to the chastening rod of God. The first one is we can despise it. Is that what I just read? Yeah. Despise not the chastening of the Lord. The second response is we can just faint. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just I can't do it, preacher, and just, just wimp out on the thing. And the third thing, if you'll look at verse number 7 there in chapter 12, is we can endure it. Yeah. Amen. Not a, you do not endure to salvation. Right. You endure the chastening of Amen. God so that you might grow. Amen. 
God does chasten His children. Amen. His children. Verse number 6. God does chasten His children. And so I looked that word up. And I always try to reference uh, Webster's 1828 dictionary before the modernists got a hold of the dictionary and changed the meaning of words. Amen. You ought to look up the word gay in there, for instance. Yeah. He changed the meaning of words. But in Webster's 1828 dictionary, the, the word chasten is defined as being corrected by punishment. Amen. And it says to inflict pain for the purpose of reclaiming an offender. Amen. That's what chastening means. In modern society, that's child abuse. But God is not interested in what modern society yeah, thinks. Yeah. This Mark Plants fella has used that method on his child and, and got in all kind of trouble because we, he's dealing with heathen people Amen. that don't know what child abuse is. Amen. Yeah. Let me help you. I'll tell you what child abuse is. Child abuse is that Parkersburg judge that took that, that reprobate that took a kid from a Christian mommy and gave it to a queer daddy. That's child abuse. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 Chastening is not child abuse. Amen. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Look at verse 15. <laughs> I, I, I need to just go ahead and get off of that before I explode. <laughs> You, this is child abuse to correct them. That, that's exactly what's the matter with them. Amen. You didn't, amen, you amen. didn't correct them. They grow up and hate you. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, amen. thank you. Well, like I said, I'm trying to get off of it. Verse number 15 says, Men can fail of the grace of God. Yeah. Amen. Isn't that a scary verse? Men can fail of the grace of God. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. I want to just stop there and, and ask you a question. How can you fail to deserve something that you didn't deserve? Do you know what grace means? Grace means undeserved failure, undeserved favor. So how could you fail something you didn't deserve? Salvation is not the purpose here. Maturity is the purpose. And to fail the grace of God is to not mature as a Christian. It's not to endure chastening. That's to fail the grace of God. God disciplines His children. He disciplines us and He corrects us. By Our, our wrong courses are corrected by His disciplining hand. Psalm 119 verse 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Before you put the whip to me, put the rod to me, I was headed astray. But now I can keep your word. Amen. To fail of the grace of God is to not comprehend the intention of His discipline. What has He got in mind? What is He trying to do? Have you ever heard that, that story about the fellow that had the marble... A horse and a fellow said, how in the world did you uh, uh, carve such a statue? And he said, well, I just took a big old block of marble and knocked off everything. It didn't look like a horse. Yeah. That's what Jesus is doing. Amen. He's knocking off everything that doesn't look like Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Because he wants to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's his purpose. Romans 8, 28, for instance, says all things works together for good to them that love God. Yeah. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18, it said, Be thankful in everything, for this is the will of God concerning you. Amen. Are you thankful for it? Or do you despise it? Or do you faint under it? Or do you endure it? He allows you to, to glory in tribulation. 
People say, oh, I, I, I'd like to have patience, but I don't. Hey, listen, patience comes by tribulation. But he allows us to glory in tribulation because that tribulation works for patience. Yeah. Romans or, or Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, whenever uh, Joseph came back with his, to uh, face his brothers again after all those years, he had that in mind that all things work together for good to them that love God. And Joseph said, you guys didn't mean it for good. I mean, you meant it for evil. God's the one that meant it for good. And I want to say today that not everything that we have experienced is good, but everything we experience is intended for good. That God wants us to do that. God uses them to accomplish His plan in our life. Deuteronomy chapter 8, God talks to Israel and He said that He used his, their disobedience uh, he, 40 years of bad stuff. But during those 40 years of bad stuff, whenever they got hungry, God fed them. Whenever they got thirsty, God gave them water from a rock. Whenever they uh, went to the shoe store, they didn't have to buy shoes. Their feet didn't swell. Uh, and their clothes lasted the duration of the punishment. And though it was bad, yet God intended to do something with those people. They learned this lesson. Turn there to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. and Let's look at verse number 3. Well, yes, this is talking about that 40 years in the wilderness. Let's go with verse number 2 also. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led these 40 years in the wilderness. He did that to humble you. He did it to prove you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commandments or not. And look here at the verse that I wanted, verse number 3. And He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that He might make thee to know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Amen. Now let me rabbit trail there just a minute. Do you see that word there, uh, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word? Do you see that is italicized? That word, I, word is italicized. You see it? You know what the scholars tell me? The scholars tell me that don't belong. You know who quoted the wrong? When when Jesus was on the Mount of Temptation with the devil, Jesus quoted an italicized word. So what I'm going to do Amen. If it is good enough for Jesus, Amen. it is good enough for me. Yeah. Man shall not live by bread only, but by every word uh, that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. Uh, God told Jeremiah a parable about fig trees, good figs. In Jeremiah chapter 24, when the nation was carried captive, Whenever they'd gone away and all of the children of Israel were went into captivity, in verse 26, God said, I know you're going into captivity, but I've got my eyes on you. Amen. <laughs> I know it's going to be hard. I know it's going to be troublesome. I know you're going to have problems. But hey, I've got my eyes on you. Amen. And I'm going to work all things for the good of them that love God. Amen. Folks in the fire get weary. Jeremiah said that. Folk in the fire get weary, but God said, I'll bring a remnant through the fire. Amen. Don't you worry about me. I'll take, I'll take, I, I like the Apostle Paul. He's one of my heroes. And one of the statements that he made that just boggles my mind, the Apostle Paul talking about our troubles and our trials, he said, our light affliction. Light! Did you ever read this man's life? Yeah, I'm talking about he was beat five times. Uh, 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 40, 40 stripes save one. 
He was in prison. He was in danger of death. Three times they beat him with rods. Three times he is stoned. Three times he is shipwrecked. A night and a day he spent in the deep. He was in journeys often. and He was in peril everywhere he went. He was in peril in waters. He was in peril in robbers. The perils of his own countrymen. The perils of the heathen. The perils of the city. The perils in the wilderness. The perils in the sea. The perils with false brethren. Painfulness. Watching off and weariness and hunger and thirst and fasting and cold and nakedness and then he said besides all that I got the churches to worry about and he said my light affliction kind of embarrasses me to complain I want to whenever I'm called on to endure the chastening of the Lord I want to endure it as a good soldier of Jesus Christ because you see our light affliction works a more exceeding weight of glory. Uh, the Apostle Peter said the trials of our faith are more precious than gold. Now here we have back in Hebrews there, we've got a, 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 a man who is an example. His name is Esau. Now I know what you know, I know, but let me, regardless of what you think, Esau was a member of the family. Amen. Regardless of what he did, Isaac was his mommy. Rebecca was his, I mean, Isaac was his daddy. Amen. Rebecca was his mommy. He was a member of the family. But he's a picture of a carnal Christian that doesn't want to walk the way he's supposed to walk. The Bible called him profane. And whenever you look up the word profane again in Webster's Dictionary, it simply means to use something that's holy uh, for a wicked worldly purpose. Profanity is to take the name of God in vain. Profane people take God's stuff and use it for wicked purposes. I think about Belshazzar the king who took the vessels of God and drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and wood and stone, taking the vessels that God had designed to be holy and using them for wicked worldly purposes. Do you know, my Christian friend, that your body is the temple of God? Do you know that it's holy as be set apart for God? And whenever we take the, the vessel that God has sanctified by the blood of His own Son, and use it for wicked, profane. But do you know we're going to get the chest in hand to God? In Romans chapter 8 and verse 6, the Bible said, Such a carnal mind will kill you. Amen. It will eventually kill you. If you do not get that thing straight, it will kill you. There is a sin unto death. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you will. And let me read here the first uh, uh, three or four verses. He's talking to a church. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to the church at Corinth. And he said in verse number 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For, and here's a good mark of carnality. For whereas there is among you envy and strife, amen, divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? In other words, walk just as like anybody else that walk. Yeah. Whenever you envy your brother, whenever you've got strife with your brother, amen, whenever you've got divisions in the church, you sow discord among the brethren, you are taking what was meant to be holy and using it for the worldly purposes. Profanity. Well, preacher, how could I live in obedience? I I don't want to be disobedient, so what can I do? I'm glad you asked me. I want to tell you. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 12, it gives you one negative and three positive things you can do. It says there to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That's the first thing you need to do is to deny what the devil is trying to force down your throat today. Deny ungodliness and 
worldly lust. Then it said, I want you to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Now, when you live soberly, that's for you. I mean, you, to be sober, you got control of your faculty. Amen. I'm thinking, I'm thinking that, you know, if you're drunk, you don't have control. But if you are sober, you've got control. So the first thing you've got to do after you deny ungodliness and worldly love is get a, get a hold of what you do for your own self. Amen. People yeah. sin against their own body. Amen. People sin against their own self. Yeah. And then it said live righteously. Righteous living is for the benefit of other people yeah. so that they can see your good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. Amen. So I got one that's for me, sober. I got one that's for my neighbor, righteous. And then it said, and live godly. Yeah. That is towards God. Yeah. God expects His people to live godly. Yeah. When we obey God, not only do we benefit from it, but other people benefit, and God even benefits from it. I think He's pleased with a child of God that'll live for him in the midst of a perverse and rebellious generation, I think we can shine as lights here in this world. Don't make no mistake, the world is not going to be happy with you. The world hated Jesus, crucified Jesus, and if they hated him, they'll hate you. If they killed him, they'll kill you if they get a chance. But you see, when rewards go around, rulership in the kingdom is directly proportionate to how you live for God down here. Rewards are 100% of work. See, that's where people miss it. Salvation is 100% of grace, but reward is 100% of work. That is, what you did will determine your position in the kingdom. Your inheritance uh, uh, may be taken away from you and given to somebody else. Strange scripture indeed. When rewards go around, rulership is designated to those that have suffered with Christ. Now Matthew chapter 25 and verse 28, uh, it talks about the talents. And it said this guy hid his talent, wouldn't use it for the Lord. And God said, take his talent away from him and give it to the guy that's got ten. And now what, does that seem unrighteous to you? God said, take it away from him and give it. But you see, this guy's already got ten. Well, you know why he's got ten? Because he used what God gave him. Over in the book of Luke, chapter 19 and verse 28, it said, take that pound away from him and give it to the guy that's got ten pounds. There was a... There is a rulership that we're going to have one day. This world is not our home. It's a temporary place. And whether we'll suffer loss for all eternity or rule for all eternity is determined on our obedience to the Word of God. Let me give you an example of a man by the name of Adonijah. If you ever check your... If you ever check your uh, scripture out and run through Chronicles there where you got all those kings and all those people begetting people and you know how boring that is. The the record is there of David's children. And Solomon was not, are you listening? Solomon was not in line for the throne. Adonijah was. Well, how come Adonijah didn't get it? I'll tell you why he didn't get it. He was rejected because he didn't live up to what he is supposed to live up to. And David said, I'm not going to put that dude on the throne. I'm going to put Solomon on the throne. Solomon took his place. Adonijah, who should have been the king, is replaced by another man. Now I want you to look in Revelation chapter 3. Stay with me here. Revelation chapter number 3. Verse 11. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. 
There is a danger, children. There is a, this thing is not what you think it is. Amen. There is a danger of you losing your rulership, yeah. losing your crown, losing your right to reign. Somebody's got to be reigned over. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, and if you're not reigning, then you're going to be reigned. Instead of reigning, you'll be reigned over. Yeah. Now here in the Revelation chapter 21 and verse 24, the Bible says, and I know I'm getting way over a lot of people's head, but that's okay. You need to swim every now and then. It said in Revelation 21, 24, the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city of the bride. Right. And if they bring in, the implication is that those nations are serving the bride. Yeah. Right. Now, <laughs> if, that be in the, if that be in eternity... Well, what do you think is going to go on in the millennial kingdom? Amen. Whenever our opportunity comes that we ought to reign, here we are, somebody's reigning over us. Yeah. Right. Now there's a whole lot I don't know. I, I don't claim to be a scholar. But I know enough that we're supposed to hold fast what we got or we'll lose something. Amen. We'll lose our reward. Amen. If we do not follow the Lord, if we do not endure chastening, if we feign under it, we despise under it, and we disobey the Word of God, we will lose our eternal reward. That's scary to me. I thank God I'm not losing my soul. But I don't even want to lose my reward. Well, how can I do it, preacher? How can I, how can I make sure that I gain a full reward? Well, here's some steps that I'd say. Number one, when you get out of bed in the morning, take up your cross and live for Jesus that day. Amen. Amen. You see this? It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. Pick up your cross and follow Him. Go outside the camp. Amen. Bear His reproach. Go outside. By that I mean the world. Separate yourself from the world. Amen. Don't, I don't want to look like the world. Amen. I don't want to smell like the world. Amen. I don't want to dress like the world. I don't want to talk like the world. Amen. I want to be separate from the world. Yeah. Amen. 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 Looking outside the camp and parent his reproach. Yeah. Yeah. I know they look at you as a holy joke. They look at you as somebody that's fanatical, but you take up your cross and go outside the world and bear His reproach. Be glad to say, hey, I'm a Christian. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Amen. The Bible said if we suffer with Him, yeah. we will reign with Him. Amen. Amen. How much suffering do we do? Well, you know, if it doesn't rain, I was aimed to attend the night of the revival. <laughs> well, you know, I was wanting to go to church, but you just wait. Winter's coming. Snow will be here in just a minute. And on Sunday morning, you listen to those churches, literally churches, thousands of them right around this area. They're not having service today. Yeah, it's too inconvenient yeah. for them. It's kind of like, uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, Jeroboam, he said, you don't have to go over there through get a whole bunch of trouble going over there. Come here and worship right here where it's convenient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think all of these charismatic churches are growing because they want to make it sinner friendly. Yeah. They want to make it convenient for people. It's not convenient to serve God. What we're going to have to do is bear His reproach and if we suffer with Him and regardless of the load that's on us now, our light affliction is only going to serve to uh, give us an eternal way to glory one day. If we suffer with Him, we'll reign with Him. So let me look over here again. I think I want to try to wind this down and say number one, do not drift away from the Word of God. Number two, I do not want you to doubt the Word of God. Number three, I don't want you to get the edge taken off of it. You remember when you first got saved, how, how sharp it was? You couldn't get enough of it. Yeah. Then after a while, you get dulled down. Don't cut like you used to. Mm -hmm. yeah. You despise. Th those people despise is my preaching. You believe that? I mean, here, me, just a little old teddy bear looking guy that wouldn't hurt a flea. And they just, they can't 
tolerate me, despise me. But listen, the bottom line is do not disobey the Word of God. If it tells you something, you believe it and you'll be saved. When you get to glory, you'll be glad that you did what you did for the Lord. You'll be sad at that that you neglected that you didn't do. Amen. In your life. I pray this, Lord, help me to live today like that I'll be glad I did when I stand at the judgment. Let's bow for prayer.